Good evening, brethren. Please take your Bibles and turn to Ruth chapter 4. Turn to Ruth chapter 4. Now, I did miss one week of preaching when my child was born, so we did miss one chapter of Ruth. And so it's my intention, intention this Wednesday night to uh, catch up on the, the chapter that we need to. We're up to the last chapter in the book of Ruth. And again, the book of Ruth is found between uh, Judges and 1 Samuel. So it's that little book with four chapters found between those two books. Uh, Ruth chapter 4 is what we're up to. And the title for the sermon tonight is The Kinsman Redeemer. The Kinsman Redeemer. It's probably a term you've heard before, the Kinsman Redeemer. It has to do with the book of Ruth. That's where it comes from. Uh, but it also points us to Jesus Christ. And my greatest advice for anybody that's reading through their Bibles, especially the Old Testament, is look for Christ. Look for Jesus Christ in everything that you read because he is found throughout all the scriptures. He is found in every book of the Bible. And the book of Ruth is, as I've mentioned before, a love story between Boaz and Ruth. But we also see the great love that God has for his people. The fact that Jesus Christ would ultimately become the kinsman redeemer as well. Now that title is given to Boaz, okay? But that title is also something that we can give to Jesus Christ. And so it's my intention tonight to show you those parallels between Boaz and Jesus Christ. Let's pick it up from verse number one, Ruth chapter four, verse one. Then, then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by unto whom he said, Ho, such a, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit ye down here, and they sat down. So let's just uh, do a quick reminder of what's led up to this. Uh, Boaz is interested in, in getting, getting uh, married to Ruth, right? But there was one kinsman, there was one person that, that was close, a closer relation to the family, and he had the right to marry Ruth before Boaz had the right. And so Boaz wanted to clarify this. He wanted to make sure that little problem went away so he could be the one that could step in and marry Ruth. And so he organizes this meeting. As it said in this verse number one, he came to the gate. And so he comes to the gate of the city. Yes, the gate was used to enter and to exit the, the city, but gates quite often in the Bible, you'll notice this, gates is a place where they would hold official business. You would have those, you know, there are elders here. So there, there are people of, of high reputation. There are a lot of decisions being made, official decisions being made at the gate of the city. And so this was a legal exchange that needed to happen. Uh, Boaz organized the meeting. He organized this new kinsman to come along and he organized 10 elders, you know, 10 people of, of good reputation that hold an official position in, the, in, the, in Israel to oversee this matter to oversee this matter and he ties it not just into marriage to Ruth as you soon see he ties it into a piece of land all right look at verse number three and he said unto the kinsman Naomi that is come again out of the country of Moab sell off a parcel of land which was our brother Amimelech's all right so I want you to notice that Boaz is saying Naomi wants to sell a piece of land now that uh, you know, the fact that Naomi wants to sell a piece of land, this is the first time it's brought up in this book, okay? And so, the point I'm trying to make here is, obviously, Naomi and Boaz had a meeting before this meeting. Obviously, they met up. Boaz explained his desire to marry Ruth, and Naomi is the one helping him along. And, and the way she contributes is to sell a piece of land. And you'll soon see that this piece of land had a condition of sale, Whoever bought this piece of land would also have to marry her daughter-in-law. That's part of the price of purchasing this piece of land. Okay? Now that meeting is not recorded for us in the Bible, but we know it took place because we see that Boaz knows that Naomi wants to sell this piece of land. And he's the one that's communicating this to, like, in an official capacity. Okay? And uh, it says here in verse number 4, And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants, and before the elders of my people, if thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Okay. 
So this piece of land is being sold. Now keep your finger there and go to Leviticus 25. Go to Leviticus 25. Let's have a look at the law of Moses very quickly here. The law of Moses, Leviticus 25. Now obviously as the Israelites came into the land of Canaan, you know, this was the promised land. This was the, the land that had God had promised uh, Moses and as they came out of Egypt that they were to inherit this land. The land was then to be divided into the tribes and the tribes divided into different families. And so obviously uh, Naomi has a piece of land and if you look at Leviticus 25 verse 23, Leviticus 25 verse 23, keep in mind that Naomi is very poor at this point in time. She's lost her husband, she, she's lost all her possessions, so she's poor. And a poor person could sell a piece of land, you know, so they would have a bit of money. They would have something that they can live on. And the law is found here in Leviticus 25 verse 23, which reads, The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine for ye are strangers and sojourners with me. First thing I want to say is, who does the land of Israel belong to? You know, right now we have, you know, it's been going on for decades, this fight between the Palestinians and the Jews about the piece of land. The Jews say it belongs to them. The Palestinians say it belongs to them. God says it belongs to Him. Okay? God says this land belongs to Him. And whoever lives on, those, on that land were sojourners. All right? Obviously, when Christ comes back to rule in that thousand-year millennial reign, that land will be given to Jesus Christ. I mean, He is God. It's, it's a land that belongs to, to Jesus Christ. Okay? So, you know, don't get caught up into the politics. Who does that Middle East piece of land belong to? Does it belong to this, these people? Does it belong to that people? The Bible is very clear. No, it belongs to God. But look at verse 24. And in all the land of your possession, ye shall grant a redemption for the land... If thy brother be waxen poor. So here's the condition. If there is a poor person that owns a piece of land, and of course, Naomi would be that person who's poor at this point in time. What can she do? And have sold away some of his possession. And if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. All right. So if you were poor, you could sell a bit of that land. You can sell a bit of your inheritance. So you had something to live off. And that was what Naomi was trying to do. Being poor, trying to get something she can live off. But notice who is the person that gets the first um, uh, opportunity to buy the land. Okay? What did it say there? If thy brother be waxed and poor and have sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. So the person that gets the first dibs on the land is the closest relation, the closest kinsman. Okay? This is why Boaz is, is grabbing this other kinsman who's a closer relation to uh, the family and saying, look, are you going to buy the land? If you're not going to buy the land, then I'll step in and buy the land. Okay? So the closest relation or the closest kinsman got the first dibs of purchasing the land. Now this is really important for you to remember. Okay? Keep this in mind. As we go on, okay, the closest kinsman had the first dibs of purchasing the land. Very important to remember as we go on through the rest of the chapter. Look at verse number five. Back in, back in Ruth chapter four, verse five. Ruth chapter four, verse five. Then said Boaz, What day thou buyest in the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance so you can see this this close kinsman says yeah i'll buy the land and then Boaz says well if you buy the land one of the conditions of sale is that you marry ruth okay that's what naomi's request is you don't just pay for the land but you also have to marry ruth and when you marry ruth that the obviously you would raise up a seed for that family name for her first the, the name of her first husband okay so there's that condition and look how the kinsman responds in verse number six and the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance, redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. So he wanted to redeem it. He wanted a piece of land. He wanted the possession, but he didn't want Ruth. He didn't want to marry Ruth. He felt that that was, I guess, marrying beneath him. You know, he could see other opportunities for his future. Maybe if he married somebody else, he would be able to inherit more land. He saw a, a, a better opportunity for himself than taking this smaller piece of land 
and marrying Ruth. Okay, so you can see the difference between this near kinsman, the, the nearest one, who's concerned about possession, who's concerned about the piece of land, and then you can see the difference with Boaz. Boaz, it wasn't about the land for Boaz. Boaz wasn't interested in the land. Boaz was interested in Ruth. Okay, he obviously had fallen in love with Ruth. He wanted to marry that woman. Okay, and that's why that condition was there. The condition was there to, you know, uh, scare away, you know, other people that may have wanted to take the land for themselves. You know, but obviously with having to take Ruth as a wife, and Boaz was like, "Oh, I'm happy to take Ruth as a wife." That was his ambition. That was his desire, right? And so the piece of land for Boaz was just a cherry on top, okay? And so you can see this man defers and says, look, Boaz, you can, you, you know, go ahead. You know, you can redeem it if you want. I can't do it. Now look at verse number seven. Now this was the manner in the former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing. So notice how the term redeem, redeeming keeps coming up. This is where we get the, the kinsman redeemer from, right? The kinsman being Boaz, the redeemer being someone that purchases something for themselves, right? So Boaz is the kinsman redeemer. He goes and he purchases and he's someone that is close of kin, someone of close relation. And let's keep reading verse number seven. It says, for to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor and this was a testimony in Israel. So if you didn't want to redeem the piece of land here, you didn't want to go and marry uh, the widow that's closest in relation to you, you would just simply take off your shoe. I mean, we see a principle of this. If a brother did not want to marry his uh, brother's widow, if she had no children, I've covered that in, in previous sermons. I won't go into all that right now. But this was just a way of showing, hey, I've taken off my shoe. It's a bit of a shame on that person. It's a, it's a bit of a sign to say, look, I, I'm passing on on this duty. I do not want to complete that. And so this is what's happening here. And then it says, verse number eight, Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. He says, look, Boaz, you buy the piece of land. You marry Ruth. Here's my shoe. I've taken it off I'm in front of, as a witness, in front of all these witnesses, these ten elders. I'm forfeiting my ability to buy this land. You know, go ahead. You know, by the law of the land, you can go ahead and take uh, this possession for yourself. Verse number nine. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Kilian's and Malon's in the hand of Naomi. So Elimelech was the husband of uh, Naomi. And just a reminder that Kilian and uh, Malon were the sons of Naomi. And Malon was the husband of Ruth. Okay, so Boaz is saying, look, there are witnesses that I have made this purchase. I mean, do you see the parallel with Jesus Christ? When Jesus Christ, you know, uh, was put to death, buried and rose again on the third day, what did he go and do for the next 50 days before he ascended up to heaven? He went before many witnesses, didn't he? He went to his disciples. He went to uh, many, many, many people, up to 500 at once. So people could, see, could witness his resurrection. So people could witness that he had purchased us with his blood. So you can see the importance there of the witnesses. You see the parallel there of Christ. Verse number 10. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place, Ye are witnesses this day. So this Boaz says, look, I am marrying Ruth. You're a witness that I'm marrying Ruth. And by marrying Ruth, I'm going to make sure that I raise up a name of the dead. Okay, so for, for Malon, his name would continue. The, the, the child that would be born from Ruth would continue on in the name of Malon. And so there would be, in a sense, a raising of the dead. Okay, raising of the name of the dead here as a picture. And of course, what is that a picture of? The resurrection that we have been purchased by Christ. He has paid it all. So one day, the dead will be raised. The dead will be resurrected. Okay, because of the, uh, the purchase of the Redeemer. Because of the purchase of the Redeemer. You can, again, see those parallels there with, with Christ. And so, as I said, Boaz is known as the kinsman Redeemer. And if you can please keep your finger there, please go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Keep your finger in Ruth and go to 1 Peter chapter 1 
because it is Christ who has redeemed us, right? Boaz redeems Ruth. He, he, he uh, continues the name of the dead. You know, he raises that name. And Christ is our Redeemer. Christ is our Redeemer. Boaz purchased Ruth from, um, by purchasing the land of Naomi. And Christ has redeemed us or purchased us by paying for our sins. You're going to 1 Peter chapter 1. And I'm going to read to you from Acts 20, 28, where it speaks about God, which says, which he have purchased with his own blood. Talking about the church of God being purchased by his own blood. So what is the transaction? When it came to Boaz, he obviously had to pay some money for that land and he had to purchase Ruth in that land. When it comes to Christ making a purchase, the Bible says that he purchased it with his own blood. The blood of Jesus Christ is what redeems us. You're going to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 18. The Bible says, For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. Okay, so Boaz paid silver and gold for the land, but you've not been redeemed by that same uh, corruptible thing. No, not by silver and gold. It says, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Okay, so you were redeemed, you were purchased, not with gold and silver, but by the blood, the precious blood of Christ. The precious blood of Christ is more valuable than any gold and silver. It says here, a lamb without blemish and without spot. It's incorruptible. Okay, you've been purchased. This is why it's everlasting. I mean, it's, it's everlasting life for so many reasons. It's, it's eternal life for so many reasons. And one of the reasons we're being told here is because the blood of Christ is without blemish, without spot. It is not corruptible. You know, the blood of Christ is incorruptible com in compared to other units of possession like gold and silver, which is corruptible on this earth. Okay, so it's eternal security. It's everlasting life because it's, that blood is everlasting. It's not corruptible. It will be always there, you know, covering us, washing us from our sins. The blood of Jesus Christ. Now, please go to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Because I, I want to stress a point here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. A lot of people understand, yeah, yeah, purchased by the blood of Christ. Okay. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, which reads, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with our Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now notice verse number two. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So when Christ came, he died not just for those that would believe on him, but he would die for the whole world. He died for every man. And the word propitiation there, quite a big word that's been brought up there. It means to be appeased or to be satisfied, okay? So if I go to the shops, I go to Woolworths or something, buy some groceries, I obviously just can't walk out with those groceries. I've got to make propitiation. I've got to satisfy the, you know, the company. So I pay what is due, you know? They, they work out, okay, groceries are gonna be $200. I put down $200, that satisfies them so I can then walk away with the purchased possession. I can work, walk away with the groceries that I've bought. When it comes to the shedding of Christ's blood, it was the propitiation. Christ was a propitiation for our sins. It satisfied the demands of the Father. It's been paid for in full. Please go to 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, which reads, Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. He loved us. Boaz loved Ruth, right? He loved us so much, he went and bought that piece of land. He went and married Ruth, 
so that she could be taken care of. God loved us so much, he sent his son. He paid for us. He paid for our souls by the sacrifice of his son. I'm going to read to you from Romans 3.25, which reads, Whom God have sent forth to be a propitiation, there's that word again, through faith in his blood. Okay, so what is the payment for our sins? How have, I, have our sins been satisfied, been dealt with, been taken care of? The full payment where God the Father is satisfied. How was it? Faith in his blood. It was the blood of Christ that washes us. And how do we receive that? Faith in his blood. Faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Okay, so full payment of your sins, the full propitiation, the full satisfaction to God the Father was by the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay, so, you know, it wasn't that long ago where I preached on the, on the importance of the body of Christ, the flesh of Christ, what that means. We can see a, a, now a great truth about the blood of Christ. It's actually what purchases us. Okay, it's what buys us. It's what redeems us. Jesus Christ is the kinsman redeemer when it comes to our spiritual life. If you can please go back to Ruth chapter 4 verse 11. Ruth chapter 4 and verse 11. The Bible reads, And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that is come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel. To, and, and, and do thou worthily in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. Notice verse 11 how it starts. And all the people that were in the gates and the elders said, We are witnesses, they said. We witness that Boaz has purchased the land. We witness that Boaz is taking Ruth as his bride. He's purchasing that and we are witnesses. And brethren, then what are we? All right, what are we? We know what Christ has done. We know how he has purchased for our, our sins. He, we, we, we can see how he purchased us. Then what? what? What's the next thing to do? Well, the next thing to do is we are witnesses. We've been purchased. We've been saved. And now we go and we witness for God. We go and say what Jesus Christ has done. Hey, these elders were witnessing what Boaz did. Well, as saved believers, we need to go and witness what Jesus Christ has done how he has purchased us with his own blood. And brethren, man, I miss the door-to-door -door soul winning. I miss it. I miss getting out there on a weekly basis to the neighborhood and giving people the gospel, being a witness to Jesus Christ. Hey, not like those false Jehovah witnesses. In fact, they're not witnesses of Jehovah. They are Jehovah false witnesses, aren't they? That, that cult, that, that, uh, that, that false religion that teaches that it's not just Christ that died, but you need to work your way for salvation. No, no, no. You don't work your way to salvation. It's been paid for by Jesus Christ in full. He is the propitiation. Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins. Not Christ and our works. No, those that teach such things are Jehovah false witnesses. We need to be true witnesses of Jehovah. We need to be true witnesses of of the purchase that Jesus Christ has made for us. Not only that, that we look at verse number 11, but notice how they celebrate. Notice the words they say after this purchase has been made. It says, The Lord make the woman that is come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah. Hey, who are they, Rachel and Leah? Those are the wives of Jacob. Hey, those are the two women by which the 12 tribes of Israel would come. Okay, and of course the handmaids as well, but the, the name that was given to Ra uh, Rachel and Leah, notice this, like Rachel and like Leah, it says here in verse number 11, which two did build the house of Israel. So he says, look, uh, uh, man, we want you to marry Ruth. We want the best for you guys. We want you to have a bunch of children. We want you to establish your own house. Like Rachel and Leah were able to establish the house of Israel. Okay, so, you know, Ruth is being elevated here. You know, Ruth is being promoted, isn't she? Ruth is being promoted to be a mother of many. And, you know, uh, as saved individuals, I spoke about the importance of us being witnesses of Christ. And here's the truth. When we go and witness of Christ, when we go and, and preach the gospel, and people understand and they believe and they call upon the Lord to save them, 
hey, we give birth to spiritual children, don't we? You know, we see a, a new soul being born again, believing on Christ, knowing that they're going to be in heaven for all eternity because of what the Redeemer has done for them. Okay, and so, you know, I'm not a woman. I can't understand. I'll never understand what it is like to have a child in me, to, to develop that little baby and to give birth. But we can relate to it even as men when we see people come into Christ as their saviour. People believing on Christ and being born into God's spiritual family. Notice what else it says here at the end of verse 11. And be famous in Bethlehem. Be famous in Bethlehem. All right. So there's two, two thoughts here. Number one is they did become famous. I mean, so famous, it's recorded for us for all eternity in the Bible, in the Word of God, isn't it? Okay, but we spoke about Boaz and how he's a picture of Christ here. And of course, who, who is the most famous in Bethlehem? You know, when you think of the town of Bethlehem, who's the first person you, you think about? It's Jesus Christ, who was born in Bethlehem. Okay, so there's a, another parallel. You know, Boaz, famous in Bethlehem, but even more famous than him was Jesus Christ. Let's keep going. Verse number, verse number 12. And let thy house be like the house of Pharaohs, to whom Tamar bore unto Judah, of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. Notice that it is the Lord who gives conception. It's the, it is the Lord that allows a woman to fall pregnant. It's the Lord that has given a woman the ability and the Lord can shut up a womb if he desires and he can open the womb if he so desires. Okay, it's, it's in the Lord's hand is what we're saying. Okay, and you know, it, it is a difficult thing when women can't fall pregnant or they can't carry a child and they might struggle with, um, you know, losing that child before it's delivered. Um, it's such a, and I, think, I mean, I just think about the, you know, the, the horrific things that our nation does. You know, was it 250 abortions a day where they would take a child that God has allowed to be in that womb, that God is knitting himself? I mean, we have the wickedness of our nation. I think of Australia, and I think about, well, it's a, it's a, I love living in Australia. It's a decent nation in comparison to many other places in the world. But there is such wickedness in this world where they cannot value a baby in the, in the mother's womb. When we're approaching Mother's Day, aren't we? We're approaching Mother's Day. I'll save a sermon for that on Sunday. But, you know, God values motherhood. God values babies in the womb. He is the one who rewards a mother and a father with a child. And she bare a son. You know, she wasn't able to have any children with her first husband. You know, I'm not sure if he just passed away too quickly or they were having difficulties. It's difficult to tell, but we can see here God is blessing Boaz and Ruth and she's able to bear a child. Verse number 14. And the woman said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, and his name, that his name may be famous in Israel. There's the famous again in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, have borne him. And Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and became nurse unto it. So Naomi has this child. And I, it's interesting the words that, that I've said here, some of the women in the, in, the, in the town of Bethlehem speaking to Naomi. Of course, Naomi is the mother-in-law, remember that? So Naomi is uh, older in age, okay? But they're saying, hey, this child, this grandchild, that, you, that God has given you, it says here in verse number 15, he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thine old age. You see, grandchildren are a blessing to grandparents. You know, my mom would say to, about, you know, Is Isabel's our, our first child. She's my eldest daughter. And um, my, my mother, you know, her grand, Isabel's grandmother would say, Isabel, you saved my life. Okay. And by that, she means, you know, when you're born into this world, you gave me hope. You gave me uh, something to look forward to, you know, and, and my mother's looking forward to seeing Isabel continue to grow. Hey, hopefully she's 
able to make it to Isabel's wedding one day. Who knows, God willing, you know, that could be a, a, a blessing for my mother. You know, so I, when I read this passage, I was thinking about my mother, how my mother would say about Isabel, you know, you saved my life. You know, you restored, you nourished, you gave me uh, strength, as it were. And so not only is Ruth blessed through this encounter with Boaz, having a child, but so is grandmother uh, Naomi. And so there is, a, there is a happy ending to this story. Okay? And notice again there in verse number 14 at the end of it, it says that his name may be famous in Israel. So not only is Boaz and Ruth famous because their, their story is recorded here for us in the Bible, but the child that uh, Ruth had would also become famous. Okay? In fact, his name is recorded for us in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Let's keep reading verse number 17. And the women... Her neighbors gave it a name saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. The father of David. Who's David? That's King David. Okay, you all know about King David. So we see Obed's name, the child that Ruth had, is mentioned here, his name. And it says in verse number 18, And these are the generations of Pharaohs. Pharaohs begat Hezron, and Hezron begat Ram, and Ram begat uh, Aminadab. And Aminadab began Nashon, and Nashon begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz. So that's Boaz that we've been reading about. And Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. So what do we learn here? That Obed, the child of Ruth, is the grandfather of King David. This is why they're famous, okay? Because the greatest king, or maybe you could argue Solomon, but I, I suppose the one that remained the most consistent as, as someone who, who had a heart after, uh, who was a man after God's own heart, was King David and Obed, this son that was born to Naomi, was the grandfather. That means, oh, sorry, Ruth. And so Ruth is the great grandmother of King David. Okay? King David. Keep your finger there. Go to Matthew chapter 1 for me. Go to Matthew chapter 1. And so we see this great story, this great love story. And how God provides. You know, God has a great love for widows. God has a great love for orphans and widows. People that are without a husband, without a father. And who tend to suffer in life because of that, you know. And fathers, you know, your role in your family is so important. You know, God is, has given you your family, your wife, your children, so you can look after them. So you can provide for them. And if you're not doing it, you know, well, God's going to judge you for that. But look... Um, go to Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 5. Let's read a little bit here. Matthew chapter 1 verse 5, because as I said, Obed is mentioned not just in the Old Testament, but he's mentioned in the New Testament. Okay? His name forever recorded for us in the Word of God. And it says here, And Salmon begat Bo uh, Boaz of Rechab, that's Boaz, of, of, uh, and Rechab there. And then it says here, And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, Okay, so there's Ruth, there's Obed again. And Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king. So King David, okay? Now backtrack to verse number one there in Matthew 1. Verse number one, it says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And so Christ, when he came to this world, okay, as our Redeemer, he came as a descendant all the way from King David, Obed, um, Boaz and Ruth. Okay, so here's why that story is in the Bible for us. Ruth, she was not a Jew at the beginning, right? She was from Moab. She had other false gods that she worshipped. Okay, I mean she would. She's a Gentile. You know, she's she's a heathen, as it were. Okay, but she desired to know the God of Israel, and she was received into the nation. She was married into the family there, and God blessed them. You know, it does, I mean, I have to say this almost every sermon, don't I? You know, God is a God of the Jews and of the Gentiles, okay? God does not favor one person over another because of their DNA, okay? Just because you're a physical Jew does not make you God's chosen people. Ruth became one of God's chosen people because she made the God of Israel her God. And God took her even with corrupted DNA, all right, I use that loosely, Gentile blood, and yet she was used to be an ancestor that would bring Jesus Christ into the world. What a great spiritual truth there. 
If you can please go to uh, Galatians chapter 4 now. Go to Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 4. And I just want to remind you that when this offer of selling the land was made, it was made first to the near kinsmen. And I said, keep that in mind. That's important. Why is that important? Galatians 4.4, 4, please turn there. Galatians 4.4, 4, which reads, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, notice the next words, made of a woman, made under the law. When Christ came into this world, when the Son of God came into this world, He was made of a woman. He became man. Okay? Why did God have to send His Son? Why did Jesus Christ come as a man? Because the one that could make the purchase had to be a near kinsman. The one that had to make the purchase had to be a relative. All right? I mean, God, this is just, you know, the, the way that God operates. We see this play out for us in the Old Testament as a truth for the New Testament. Jesus Christ had to come as a man. And Jesus Christ had to redeem us as a close relative. You know, he was made like sinful flesh, the Bible tells us. He was a man. And as a man, he had the right to make the purchase. You know, and there's no other way. There's no other man, just like the other near kinsmen, who couldn't make the purchase. You know, he didn't want to redeem the land and roof. He couldn't do it. Well, there's nobody on this earth that can save themselves. There is nobody that can save another man on their behalf. The only Savior, the only Redeemer is Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 5. To redeem, there it is, that word, redeem. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Please go to Galatians 3, verse 13. Galatians 3, verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. The crucifixion of Christ on the cross, the shedding of his blood, that's how he redeemed us from the law, by the shedding. That's the payment. Remember, the payment for our sins was the shedding of the blood of Christ on the cross. If you can please turn to Titus chapter 2. Turn to Titus chapter 2. And I'll read to you Luke chapter 1 verse 68. You go to Titus 2. Luke chapter 1 verse 68 reads, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and have raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. That David, King David, right? That, that family line that brought Jesus Christ into the world. But it says here that God has visited us and redeemed his people. We are the people of God. If you're redeemed, you are the people of God. Okay? Once again, not physical Jews. They are not the people of God. The people of God are those that are redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of Christ. And we receive that by placing our faith on the blood of Christ. Amen? You're in Titus chapter 2. Look at verse number 13. Not only was the redemption for our salvation, for our souls... But this plays into a greater truth in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, which reads, Looking for that blessed hope, now of course that's the rapture, soon see, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Okay, so Christ has come not just to redeem our souls, but redeem us from all iniquity. That's why we're looking for that blessed hope, the rapture, because we're going to get the new resurrected body. No more iniquity found in our flesh on that day when you receive your new bodies. And uh, that's salvation. Salvation is faith on what Christ has done for us. And you know what? Salvation was the same in the Old Testament. You know, in the Old Testament days, they had to place their faith in the Redeemer. You know, they had to uh, place their faith on Christ. And you know, Job chapter 19, Job an Old Testament saint, Job who wasn't even an Israelite, okay? Job 19 verse 25 reads, this is the words of Job, For I know that my Redeemer liveth. Did Job need a Redeemer? Yes. 
And he says, look, my Redeemer is alive. Not only will he die, but he's going to come back from the dead. It says here, he liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. So Job knew that the redeeming power of Christ was not just for his soul, but also for his body. That one day his body would be resurrected. Yes, his body would go in the grave. Yes, his body would be destroyed by worms and by whatever nasty creatures, you know, rot away the flesh there. But one day in his flesh, in his new resurrected flesh, he's going to see his Redeemer. He's going to see his God. Now, I want to conclude, if you can, please turn to... Uh, uh, let's go to Revelation chapter 5. Let's go to Revelation chapter 5 and verse number 9. I just want to conclude on a few passages here. So Christ is our Redeemer. Praise God. You know, thank you, Lord, for, for, the great, for the great sacrifice. You know, thank you for the purchase. We can thank our Lord God and worship Him and honor Him with that truth. But you know what? Now that you're purchased, you know, if you go and you purchase something, it belongs to you now, doesn't it? Like I gave the analogy of going to the shops, you buy the product once you've purchased, once you've satisfied the demand for that product, you walk away with it, don't you? It's now, it now belongs to you. Well, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, the Bible reads, And they sang, they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. There's that confirmation again. How are we redeemed to God? By the blood. Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And has made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. So not just resurrected bodies, but the redemption also promises us to reign with Christ in his millennial kingdom. And where we have been made kings and priests. Kings and priests. Listen, kings were to pass judgment, weren't they? Kings were to honor God. They were there to give direction, to pass judgment. They were there to fight in wars as well. They were there to be the lead in fighting wars, to be a soldier, as it were. And the priest was there to serve the Lord, was to serve in the house of God, was to serve the people. You know, God has given us those responsibilities for, to us now. Okay? He has made us kings and priests through his purchased blood. Okay? Through, through, the, uh, yeah, through, through, through the redemption that's come through his blood. And so God has given us work. He's given us an office of a king. He's given us the office of a priest. And he wants us to use what we've been given, obviously, to work for him, to serve him. And, you know, my challenge to you, brethren, is how are you serving God? In what capacity of, of your life are you putting, you know, uh, your, your purchased possession to serve God? In, in what manner, brethren? If you can now please go to 1 Corinthians Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. Very uh, common verse here, which reads, For ye are bought with a price. Did you know you've been bought? You've been purchased with a price. That price we saw was the blood of Christ. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You belong to God. You've been purchased by God. You belong to Him. Are you going to allow God to use you? God has already given you work to do. Are you going to serve Him with your body? Let's say there, glorify God in your body. How do you glorify God in your body? You serve God. You serve the people of God. You serve in your local church. You serve by being a witness of the redemption of Jesus Christ. That's how we serve God in our body. Okay? If you can go to verse number 7, uh, sorry, chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 23 reads, Ye are bought with a price. There it is again. Be not ye the servants of men. You say, oh man, does that mean I can't work for a boss? No, no, no. Obviously, if you're working for an employer, remember, you still set Jesus Christ as your boss. Okay? You're still serving Christ first and foremost. But listen, you can live out your life now. You've been purchased, you're saved, you're going to heaven 100%, you know, 
and you can either you can make a choice. You can either decide to serve man, or you can make the decision to serve God. You know, and there have probably been times in your life where you've served man, where you've cared about being recognized by man, where you've cared more about what men thought of you than what God thought of you. No, no, no. The instruction, brethren, you're purchased by that kinsman redeemer is that you now serve God. You go and, and serve him. He's, he's the one that has purchased you. And I'll just end on Psalm 19, verse 14, which reads, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Okay? O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Okay? So it's not just serving the Lord in our bodies. Okay? But what else did it say in Psalm 19, 14? Let the words of my mouth, let the meditation of my heart, the things that you say, the things that you meditate on, the things that you have deep thought about, let them be things that are godly. Let them be things that honor God. Okay? He wants you to serve Him in your body, but He also wants your service and your worship and, and your honor toward Him inwardly. And of course, you know, by the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What comes out of your mouth dictates to others what is in your heart you know is is your heart about men is it about worldliness is it about sinfulness or is or is what's in your heart about your love for god you know your appreciation for how he has delivered you from your sins okay so jesus christ he came to be a man he came to be our kinsman and he came to redeem us and he did it by the shedding of his blood he paid the full price Praise God for the parallel that we see in the story of Boaz and Ruth. God bless.